Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Coming to you from... My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, we welcome Peter Mark Adams. Peter is the author of the recently released Scarlet imprint title, The Game of Saturn. In addition to being the author of my current jam, Peter is also a professional energy worker and meditation specialist. Peter, thank you very much for your time. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Gordon. Yes, Great I'm... fan of your podcast. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, well, I'm a great <laughs> fan of your book. Before we get to uh, the traditional first question, I just have to take my hat off. It is without question one of the most thought-provoking books I've read in, in a long time. It's a, it's a splendid achievement. I thank you so much. And uh, Alkistis, as we were saying just before I hit the record button, has outdone herself. This is, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic looking thing as well. Yeah. I think with uh, any work of, especially highly illustrated work of nonfiction, there's a hell of a job. Uh, involved in organizing all its components. And uh, I couldn't have asked for a better partner than Scarlet Imprint on this project. Oh, They've look, been fantastic. They've been fantastic. I, I, I second that. When uh, when mine came out, I got uh, many and, and justifiable uh, compliments and praise for the look of the book. And I said, I just work here. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, just, I just did the words. That wasn't me. Yeah. And uh, it's not just the quality of dedication and professionalism, it's the understanding of, of the process of dealing with talismanic publishing well, yes. has an extra dimension. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So uh, really, I I'm delighted with the uh, professionalism and support I've had from them. Because this book went right down to the line, Gordon. I mean, we were still um, uncovering major new insights right up to the point at which it was being sent to the print shop. See, I was up visiting Peter and Alcestis when uh, not long after you'd sent through saying, hey, I've got this. Do you think it might be something? And uh, Peter was talking to me about it. And it was like the beginning of a, a quest. He's like, this guy has something here that and we're just going to keep pulling on that thread. And, uh, and I'm very glad you all did. Yeah. I think it's done now, but the, there's huge chunks of this deck which remain uncovered. So I hope somebody else is going to pick up the baton and run with it. <laughs> well, yes, absolutely. All right, well, on with the show, Peter. So question yep. one, were you a weird kid? Yeah, boy and man, Gordon, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Yeah, what can I... <laughs> yeah, let's go like, like David Copperfield, begin at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, it started for me when I was very, very young. I mean, I remember one day, long before school or preschool or anything, I was just playing one day, and it suddenly occurred to me that there was a like an arc of awareness out of the usual. And uh, as as my attention went there, this like cold air started piling in behind me and building up. And at a certain point, I was just terrified. <laughs> I fled. Well, I you, think, said, uh, you said you were um, born north of Liverpool. I mean, the air's not yeah. that warm up there. No, no, this, this was in a, in, a, in a house, you know, yeah. sealed. <laughs> <Gotcha. This> was, <laughs> you know, I was a young kid playing. You know, this, this is something I've been able to repeat years and years later, and it's still there. And that was it? That was kind of when you realized maybe things aren't uh, as commonly discussed when it comes to reality? Yeah, I think people who have these types of experiences um, experience reality as far more porous than most people. And, and, and when you've kind of had the experience, you don't know when it's going to break through into your dream space, into your daily waking space. So you you carry that. It's 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 what Otto called the encounter with the numinous, and it's it's always unfathomable, overwhelming, but strangely and darkly compelling at the same time. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, and you were saying before we hit the button um, from north of Liverpool to East Africa. Yeah, very early in life. Um, 
back in the early 60s, we moved out to East Africa. I, I, it was strange, though. Before we went, there was a large exhibition of Tutankhamun down in London. It's one of the um, first times, possibly, they, they moved all the treasures around the world so people could see them. It was. That was I'm a British Museum member. That was a very famous uh, exhibition. That's one of their kind of post-war cornerstone things. Mm-hmm. I remember looking at the the um, Sunday magazine, you know, the, the beautiful images. I was totally captivated by this. And strange thing is, within nine months, I was actually standing in front of the real things in Cairo. <laughs> Very fortunate. And so you, uh, presumably it was because of one of your parents had work in East Africa? Yeah, 62, 63, um, Britain let go all these colonies and perhaps uniquely um, set out to make sure they had all the technical talent they needed for the transition. So a whole wave of people like my father, who's a technical uh, engineer, a manager, um, were sent out from the UK to help with this transition. And that's why, I mean, otherwise there's no other way we would be there. I mean, Kenya was traditionally a very upper class uh, place for whites. But this new wave of people, we're all grammar school graduates or, you know, teachers, this type of person, technical managers, engineers and what have you. So that was very, very interesting period. We lived there for 10 years or so. So did you go to school in, obviously you went to school in Kenya? Yeah, I had to come back for a boarding school, which I couldn't tolerate. So as soon as I could, I, I burrowed out under the razor wire and, and searchlights and uh, started life outside. Yeah. I was about 15 years old or 16. Nice one, nice one. Were there any, um, did the numinous reassert itself at any stage in East Africa? It's it's always there in, in a way, uh, Gordon, not always tangibly so, but it, it never lets you get too far away. It's like it gives you a sharp pull on the lead. You know? <laughs> and was this something, I mean, if you said, you, I, I actually like that metaphor of, of, you know, crawling under the razor wire and escaping the lights and, and, and off to freedom. There's, I think it's Mark Twain, to quote my father used to use when uh, we were growing up, I think it's a Mark Twain quote, uh, leave home before you turn 18 when you still know everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. So was it well, off to like, I... yeah, off to the Bright Lights Big City after that? Yeah, I got a job and uh, I couldn't stomach it. Whenever I have a dull period in life, something always comes into it to pull me back. And I found Crowley's Moonchild on on a um, small book rack in the most remote place you can imagine, you know. So I I, I keep having these reminders occurring in random places, you know, call me. And was that, I mean, I was going to ask that, was there a through line from uh, the sort of uh, odd experience as a kid to, um, was there ever a time where it wasn't there or did you fall away and have to come back? I mean, were you... Um, if this was, let me do the maths on that. If it's early seventies, were you a Crowley kid at this point? No, I mean early seventies. We had um, my brother was bringing Dennis Wheatley paperbacks. I'll be the late sixties, early seventies. Of course, Crowley features in those, not very positively, but he's there. And we had Man, Myth, and Magic magazine. <laughs> That's a common refrain on the show. Yeah. So. The, the, you know, there were a lot of tarot cards around all of a sudden, the uh, Smithwaite deck, and it, it was very early days, I felt, you know, it, compared to today, compared to the information resources you have today, it was pretty barren then. So you had to make uh, as good use as you could of what was available, which is very little. <laughs> It's it's barren in a different way. So one of the things previous guests have mentioned specifically about man, myth and magic, or even the fact that there was a, a kind of cultural space for things like comics at the time, is you probably couldn't do uh, man, myth and magic at the um, 
I don't want to say like production level, but almost like the 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 lurid production level today. So one of my previous guests, Charlotte Rogers, she's based in the UK uh, and has been for basically her whole adult life. But she was she's a Kiwi, so mm. she had a similar thing at a similar time, but in Wellington. So basically, right across the world, uh, Man Myth and Magic was doing what um, paranoid Christians thought Dungeons and Dragons was doing in the next decade, which was you know turning <laughs> yeah, people into the occult. You. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which it was. <laughs> you mentioned tarot cards, and you have just recently released a book on tarish cards. Uh, has that been an interest all along? Was it was it sort of love at first sight for tarot cards? Oh, absolutely! I, you know, the, the day I open my first deck will it will stay with me forever. We'll go on. <laughs> <laughs> these these things have a, a very intangible quality about them, Gordon. Um, we're, we're talking more in the realm of uh, aesthetic yeah. appreciation. There's, there's not, so to speak, a narrative. You always remember your first, though. So even if it's innocuously purchased at a WH Smith at a train yeah. station, you always remember the first one. Yes, indeed. I'm, I'm not a great collector of decks, I must say. I've only had a few. Um, but I do cherish the ones I have. <laughs> nice one. And well, let's let's talk about Solabuska then. And where I said Tarish, uh, mm -hmm. um, what are they, and why aren't they tarot? They're essentially gaming decks, and they are still used for that purpose. Um, the Solabuska, I mean. These gaming decks have been produced in Ferrara from at least 1440, and most of them seem to have the regular features of the triumphal al allegorical model that characterizes most tarot decks. The Solar Busker doesn't fit that, that frame at all. It's quite idiosyncratic, except for like two or three cards that um, seem to have a connection with more traditional tarot imagery. So although it has the format of a tarot deck i would question whether it really is one or if it is one it's a it's a it's a highly idiosyncratic one it was never intended for gaming as far as i can see and the fact that it's been preserved um in in a practically pristine state for 500 years suggests it was never used for gaming it was always a collector's piece um I don't I don't accept most of the narratives that have surrounded this deck up to now, that it could be a wedding present, for instance. I mean, its imagery is too violent and homoerotic for that. Um, I don't believe it's an alchemical tract because it simply lacks the kind of sense of a process with a beginning, middle and end that is characteristic of uh, alchemical texts. And nor is it a historical exemplar because the historical figures embedded within it are so obscure and uh, so ambiguously denoted as to be almost useless for that purpose. So it couldn't serve an educational purpose either. And at least half the trump cards are, are totally unidentifiable. So almost on every count you can think of, it fails uh, to meet any of the criteria you, you would expect to see in, in, a, in a deck that was created for a specific use or application in normal life. Um, I, I second that. I, I thought it was one of the things that really interested me about reading the book when you're talking about how it's, it's, it can't be for want of a worst description historical teaching deck because you kind of go into detail about the, some of the characters so there are historical arcs to do with uh, Carthage and Alexander the Great which we'll get onto but if you actually mm. and Rome of course and but if you actually look at the characters in them you you essentially have like a a one line extra rather than a caesar and and you think that's that's really odd. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's I mean, going to be, the, that's not going to be on the final exam. So what's it doing in here? Exactly. So the, the Dex designer appears to have drawn on the same sources that Shakespeare did for his historical plays. But as you say, uh, he doesn't come up with any of those historical figures. And in fact, some of the figures are the most disreputable 
characters you can imagine. <laughs> Well, the, as you say, the deck's quite violent. There's, you know, babies hanging over cauldrons and, and um, you know, big daggers through heads. And, and it's a remarkable... Decapitation. Yeah, as you say, I mean, other than your thesis, the um, the second best one in speech marks is the, is the wedding gift thesis, right? <laughs> now, well. you wouldn't be invited back. No. <laughs> To put it mildly. Yeah, so um, you, you mentioned some of the text. This is one of the questions I wanted to ask. Uh, um, that Some of the same ones that Shakespeare drew on, and what's interesting there is um, whether or not you think Shakespeare is Shakespeare. He quite clearly had an understanding of um, things like Hermeticism, even just in the layout of, of the theatres that... Um, indicates yeah. that he's he's drawing he's kind of doing the same thing where he's 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 playing these the, the return of these classical decks like an organist and uh so my question is what you mentioned say uh porphyry's on the cave of the nymphs which which is in there mm. so what are the texts that you think whoever created this deck had access to like what are the principal source classical texts that they th they th uh, you think they've drawn on in the creation of the solar busca deck Okay, uh, the Picatrix, I think, features large because uh, the deck has a cosmology built within it. In fact, we could say the deck is constituted at the deepest level of three elements, uh, um, a metaphysics, a cosmology, and a ritual praxis. And, and because of those, the presence of those three elements, I describe it as a pagan Renaissance grimoire. Um, and as perhaps the only surviving um, trace of a Hellenistic system of surgical magic. Okay. So the text it draws upon are the ones relevant for the three elements required to make it work. Metaphysics, cosmology, and its ritual practice. And for the cosmology, I think the Picatrix probably uh, features larger than anything else. Um, and we know that that was an important text in Ferrara because it, it was used extensively um, for the decoration of the Palazzo Schifanoia frescoes, huge uh, astrologically themed and talismanic uh, fresco cycle. And, and that, that fresco cycle has drawn extensively on the Picatrix. So, you know, that is definitely one of the key texts. Well, um, one of the sort of revelations for me in this book, um, Peter, let's turn it into a question. What were the general attitudes to magic like in the 15th century, particularly, you know, uh, among the elite in places like Ferrara and Bologna? I think it was pervasive, uh, Gordon. It, it, it was it was totally woven into the fabric of day-to-day -day life. And I think that was true for the uh, De Este Dukes of Ferrara, all of whom uh, drew extensively on astro astrological <laughs> prognostication on a daily basis to determine what to do or not what not to do. Um, and astral magic itself uh, was also pervasive throughout uh, the Renaissance. And, you know, key figures in court, such as uh, Pellegrino Prisciani, served as court astrologer, as well as many other functions. And their job would be to ensure that the stars were always aligned with uh, whatever political or financial uh, initiatives the, the dukedom had going at the time. So pervasive, that, that's the, the only word to describe it. And also potentially brazen. I think it was in this. I've been um, reading some um, historical texts that are similar, but it might have been in A Game of Saturn. But one of these guys was summoned by the Pope um, to Rome. And yeah, that's... With that, yeah. Do you want to tell that story? Yeah. Well, that's Bors Borso d'Este, the Duke. And he checked the astrological prognostication for the trip and decided no. He, he didn't go, and the Pope was quite annoyed with him. They couldn't shift him. Well, of anyone in Europe that you say, I'm sorry, the stars <laughs> yeah. tell me not to come, you picked it like literally the last person in Europe you should say that to. And that is, I think, an indication of, one, the, the attitude and the um, 
which we're going to get to, uh, the attitude of the uh, elite Northern Italian families just in general, but also the fact that this was, uh, you could be brazenly normal about this. They were not fucking around. It wasn't a, a backroom hobby. Yeah, and even the Inquis- Inquisitor's records that we have uh, clearly indicate that the whole cast of clerics, priests and monks who um, made magic their profession were in the employ of the elite. They were protected by them um, and were able to to conduct almost any kind of magic imaginable. So let's wind this back a bit. Um, we, we've kind of gone through what the deck isn't and what it probably is. Uh, who do you think it was made for? Who was it made for? I think there's two issues with this deck going. One is its design. And the second one is its uh, localization for a specific client. Uh, and, and these are two quite distinct uh, levels of discourse. Um, the simpler answer to the question of the localized deck, the, it's colored, it has the coats of arms uh, and various other signs on it, is that it was for a patrician Venetian. Um, and I believe that that, patrician was uh, Manudo Sanudo, the uh, great diarist of Venice. Um, the coats of arms represent his, his father and his mother's line. So th- there's quite a story about how the deck would come to be decorated and delivered to him. Um, the, the deeper question is why the deck was ever designed in the first case at this degree of complexity and why traces of it show up around Europe. There's cards in Austria, in in France, Germany, and the uh, UK. And there was a a complete version of the deck reported being seen in Naples at the turn of the 19th century. So that's a much bigger issue than the um, issues around the localization of what we call the solar busker with its, its color and its coats of arms. There's two levels we have to address well it's why i I so enjoyed the book and and i've been obsessed with it since i was up seeing peter and alkistus and and they mentioned that they were going to be working on it is um it's a very interesting it's one of those artifacts that like switches on a light and all of a sudden you're standing in this ballroom because it's as you kind of say there's there's the stories of who it was made for and and so on but it's um the how and why, well, not even the how, but it's the why and the context of it in in Venice in particular that really, really opens it up because we're we're kind of at the 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 point in history where the classical world was being rediscovered for you know following the sort of um, diaspora of of Greek texts and Greek teachers um, out of the east following. Um, you know the the collapse of Byzantium mm. and so on. So this brand new stuff is is showing up, and what this one demonstrates because there's a there's a range of stories about Venice, and and it's always been an open question of like, well, how how into this were they? How <laughs> at an elite level, how mm. into their magic and their paganism and even their diabolism, really? Mm. were mm. they and and that's what the solar busca i think for me like it's it's one of those artifacts that you go this can only come this can only exist in a world where they were very serious about it yes it, it, it's it's a potent grimoire of the darkest imaginable sorcery i i can't think of any other description of it and it was absolutely intended for serious use to trace why it was central um, to the political elite, you have to wind the clock back and the geography back to Byzantium, because that's where it has its source. Go on. <laughs> There's a strain of Platonic philosophy which was always committed to empowering an effective elite. You could say that Platonic philosophy in its essence was a philosophy designed to ensure that the elite had the power to control and run a state effectively. And 
because of the esoteric elements built into Platonism, which have been largely ignored in the way in which Plato is taught in the West, um, it always had a linkage to, oper to operative rights, let's say, to an, to an operative level of, of um, ritual. And of course, these linkages are lost uh, in the way in which Plato is handled uh, as, as the source of Western philosophy. So from Plato, you go directly to the Orphic mystery cult and you go forward in time to the development of Thergy so that you have a connectivity between the kind of uh, rites of initiation that characterize the ancient mystery cults, the bringing down of deity into um, the, um, the mystery, and the later performance of these rites on a more individualized basis as Thergy, and, uh, and characterized especially by people like Iamblichus, the later Neoplatonist in the second, third centuries and so on. So the linkage is, is through Plato. And what's, and, and Plato was kind of new, like what we need to sort of situate for listeners is uh, mm. this stuff shows up as, as jewels from, uh, from a higher state in, 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 in history. Um, these were the wisest and, and most powerful, and all of a sudden they're coming back. And for people, like, the Venetian elite were dangerous. Uh, Venice didn't fuck around when it came to anything, to, to banking, to shipping, to wars, what have you. These were not... Oh, the slave trade, for that matter. Well, absolutely. The white slave trade. <laughs> yeah. Um, these these guys, are, and all of a sudden they have these texts, and, and this is what, it, like, cause I, um, as a background... Uh, I read a lot of books that uh, most occultists are too cool to read. So um, parapolitical researchers like um, Dr. Joseph Farrell and so on have written multiple mm. books about Venice. And I'm yeah. I'm definitely not in the too cool to read those things. I read those things. And mm. uh, one of the things, there's a hypothesis, and I think it's fairly well supported, that the Venetians sent at least one expedition to try and find the New World, the, the famous Zikmini um, expedition. And people have tried to work out who that is, and there's some tenuous name connections up to, for instance, the Sinclairs and, and, and so on in, in Scotland. So it starts to get into that full-blown, esoteric, alternate history, lurid world. But sure. the challenge has always been like, well, did they get access to the maps that came from Byzantium and did they take them seriously enough? That's been a bit where that's where you've kind of, that's yeah. where it's been hazy bringing it into maybe this is a real historical thing that happened. And all of a sudden you get something like these cards that indicates, well, they were certainly taking it pretty fucking seriously. And it, it really opens the door of, uh, of whether or not when you have dangerous people with access to brand new information, <laughs> brand new to them, uh, mm. just quite how far they'd go with it. Yeah, I think I think our problem looking back on the past, Gordon, is that we live in such a secularized and materialistic culture. We forget what it is like to live in an era of belief. Um, and for these people, as you say, the, the texts that they were looking at, like Timaeus, the Chaldean oracles and so on, had an authority which is difficult for us to uh, grasp now. Yes. The, the, these, yeah. these texts were absolutely authoritative, and Byzantium was the source. I mean, if every, everyone in the West looked towards Byzantium for wisdom. So the chances that anyone coming from Byzantium with this kind of information and with these kind of texts would be taken very seriously indeed. And we know that huge sums of money passed hands for uh, the texts that were brought across. So we have the Orphic hymns, um, Porphyry, and all of this material started flooding into Italy because the wealth was there to purchase it. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing, um, do you actually, I'll turn this into a question as well. Um, mm. Do you think the fact, so many of this, the highborn Venetian families, have a mythology that they are refugees from ancient Rome. Uh, 
so that following the collapse of Rome to the barbarians, they fled north up to um, where Venice is now, but it was essentially a swamp. And uh, this is one of those kind of mythic pieces of history, bloodline bits of history that probably didn't happen, but, well, not exactly in that direct transfer sense. Uh, Do you think the fact that they already had a familial mythology of bloodlines back to the ancient world made this sort of thing like catnip because there's, and I'll get you to describe this there's there's some tantalizing, tantalizing indications of bloodline mythology implied in the cards. Absolutely. It, It doesn't just go back to, it goes back to Troy specifically. It goes back to Troy and the fall of Troy. And that's why Virgil's uh, Ennead, it was such a key text for educationally and for all of these elite families. They all look towards Troy as their ultimate uh, source. Well, and this is, I mean, one of the really fascinating things about the book is it's always been an open question as to where, uh, as to whether this, the belief in these bloodline connections was just something that you put on the family crest. But, uh, I mean, talk us through the, the, the thesis that in fact, that's not the case. Like they were actually probably quite serious about this, this bloodline connection. I think you need to, again, try and get into the mindset that they would have had then. Uh, and part of that mindset included access to realities, which, uh, are not, not uh, thought of as credible now. Um, Bloodline is one way of expressing a sense of continuity, a sense of the cycles of time. And the core idea in Plato is that the soul is eternal and is in a continuous process of metapsychosis, driven by the deities that you worship or are closest to. Okay, the, the, this metaphysical machine is driving the belief systems that you're describing. And uh, that's an important point because one of the one of the reasons that this sort of thinking was so dangerous is that Orphic assertion that the soul exists prior to birth, which is not uh, which wasn't the the law of the land in uh, in Catholic Italy at the time. Yeah, these these were all deemed heretical beliefs in the third, fourth centuries, at least, and and heavily suppressed thereafter. But of course, this Gnostic element in human thought never goes away. You can never uh, eliminate it because of the fact that it's based on real experience. Well, actually, this is going to be one of the questions, and I might I might come back to the to the Orphic piece, but uh, I think the case to be made. They don't do Gnosticism, or they didn't do Gnosticism, the way we've come to expect people to do it. Theirs was a very uh, a ruthless Gnosticism. Uh, there's, there's almost a not, not as far as nihilism, but it, with a model of Gnosticism that they have, looking at these texts, it kind of gives them a, a metaphysical right to rule. Yes, exactly. I mean, normally we think of the Gnostics as these um, ascetic individuals uh, trying to free themselves from materiality. And this is this is the predominant model that we have of the Gnostics, and it's certainly characteristic of the Khazars and Bogomiles and so on. Um, but there's another model, a far more tribal model, if you like, which seeks to use the mechanism of metapsychosis and identification with a deity to drive uh, incarnation into equally privileged circles. So it's partly how you conduct yourself in life. It's, it's honoring a certain class of deity, and it's also taking care of the death ritual. Well, this was... Um... I, I want to bring it down to, to specifics for people who are listening and haven't had the benefit of either writing the book or reading it. Um, there is an indication in your interpretation in the cards that there is a kind of, well, if this is how the world, if this is how the universe runs, we may as well run it, <laughs> is almost, yeah. is almost <laughs> the idea. So if you Couldn't could maybe... Couldn't have put it better myself, Gordon. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so if you could maybe give us some indication of some of the specific cards, because I'll make sure I have them the images up in the show notes. But if you could kind of talk us through that little bit, because I loved it. I, this was the bit that kind of, I think you have captured the sort of 15th century Venetian elite uh, attitude quite well. Yeah. Um, I think it's because of the central importance of Porphyry's text on the Cave of the Nymphs that I found the key into the deck. Um, in the months leading up to the start of this project, I'd been re revisiting Mithraism and, and updating myself with some of the more recent research on it. But for that reason, it was very much in mind when I started puzzling over the, over the cards. And I finally came to a hypothesis that two of the cards specifically seem to represent figures who are always in uh, the core of the Mithraic imagery. Um, I don't know if we want to mention the specific cards at this point. But... No, yeah, do so, do so. So we can, <laughs> okay, like, people it's... can look them up as they're listening and get where we're talking. Okay. So um, the two cards were Trump 2 Posthumio and Trump 11 Tulio. And these two figures have respectively a, a downturned and an upturned torch in their hands. Okay. And, and the, these two figures are interpreted by Porphyry um, in the context of the Mithraic mysteries as representing the solstices. So this was a hypothesis by which I prized the deck open. I then went off to try and say, well, okay, if the Mithraic torchbearers are in the deck, there should be a representation of the bull-killing scene, the Tauroctony itself. And so I found the bull easy enough. It's seven Deo Toro. But the figure of Mithras was a little more obscure. And in fact, he's encoded as 13 Catone, where he appears as Perseus Mithras. So we have the solstices and we have the central figure of the Mithraic mystery cult encoded within the deck. As I say, the only source I could think of that they could have got this from is, is Porphyry's On the Cave of the Nymphs, the classic text. Um, so the solstices in this system, or at least in Porphyry's interpretation of the system, represent the points of ingress and egress of the soul into and out of material reality. This being the case, I figured there must be some other indicators that may help to confirm this. And I found, I mean, the gates of the sun, which is drawn from Plato, the, the, the concept of these two gates by which souls enter and leave material existence in classical imagery was depicted as a globe with two intersecting bands, the points of intersection being the gates of the sun. So again, I uh, went back to the... Um, to the cards, and I found the King of Swords, Alexandro M, bearing a globe with two intersecting bands, and 20, Trump 21 Nebuchadnezzar also um, has a large globe behind him with two intersecting bands, which seems to be guarded by a large dragon. <laughs> so I, I took these as proof that the deck uh, embodied a, a metaphysic, um, a platonic metaphysics based on the heretical doctrines of the eternal life of the soul and its metapsychosis through the gates of the sun. And this is, this is pure Platonism. It is. It's, uh, it, it, um, the kind of version of Gnosticism that they have there is a, a bit orphic, as you say. So the soul predates um, life, predates its physical existence. And on its way into physical existence, it kind of gets... Um, bounced through different layers, uh, almost like a pinball machine, down into a physical form, and those bounces are the things that kind of make you your astrological or arconic or demiurgic influences here in matter. And yeah. uh, those that kind of th that story and that motif is in there. And what's fascinating, I think, about the personality of the deck is. So speaking of Crowley, it's actually something Crowley said about the Buddha, which is the Buddha should have known better, um, <laughs> which is just classic him. But this is this is sort of Venetian 
to the core, which is if this is how things are going to work, we're, we're going to run things. Like, uh, it's a very different kind. It's kind of like... How can we make money from this? Essentially, it's like, oh, so there's a demiurge. How do we buddy up with him? You know, if we're down here and if none of this matters, then we might as well run it. Yeah. And it's funny that the latest research on Carthage suggests that the child sacrifices there were done in very much that mode of thinking they were not asking for something by doing it. They were reinforcing a long-standing tie that they had. And that very much reflects what you're you're just saying now, Gordon. And is that why the, I mean, let's talk about the Carthage motif. It's one of the strongest ones that's uh, in there. I mean, do you think that's why? And where did they get their Carthage information from? Was this from the Roman historians or was it elsewhere? I think the Akora, we mentioned um, Virgil's Ennead earlier as a prime source uh, for the familial myth of these elite families in the Renaissance. And of course, the whole action pivots around leaving Troy and going to Carthage. So the, the fleeing Trojans are, so to speak, pursued by Saturn's daughter who is the queen of Carthage she is she determines their fate well you mentioned Saturn why is it called a game of Saturn (laughs) it's a very good question it's when you put together all the lines uh, all the layers out of which this deck's iconography is constructed they have one common Thing, you know, one thing in common. That's a reference to the demiurge as Kronos Saturn, not the planetary deity, not the planetary Saturn, but the, the demiurgic one. So it's the one, one thing that unites all the diverse threads throughout this deck. And the predominance of purple is obviously imperial, but that is a Saturnine color. Uh, which I, yes. I think visually is, is quite interesting because it, when you say that Saturn, it, it, when you say it's soaked in Saturn, um, yeah. it really, like it visually is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So this is speculation. We'll never know this, but you know, you've just written a book on it. So you're a pretty good person to ask. Um, if it wasn't a card game, what was it for? Was it, is it, and I, I say simply, you can't see me using the, like my fingers to make speech marks, but is it, <laughs> is it simply an ad memoir uh, for this sort of rebuild of a kind of dark pagan Gnosticism among the elite families? I mean, what do you think it was for when, if it was ever used as anything, <laughs> what was it used for? It's a grimoire, Gordon. As in these cards were used to summon up the things that are depicted in them? Absolutely. The one card that shows signs of having been held by someone is Epeo, the one showing the monk with dragon wings, a figure thoroughly possessed by Kronos Saturn. So we know that cards have been used in this way through history. They're they're obviously very handy. visually and it's easy to incorporate them into any ritual and i believe that that's what this deck was used for both aid memoirs you say but also to feature in rituals because it 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 incorporates within itself everything necessary um for successful ritual and as you mentioned it, it it came over in the same sort of influx into europe of uh text like the Orphic hymns and and there's and and Aeneid has you know hymns in it as well and and all of this stuff does the temptation um having read this stuff in you know in Latin um but having read it for the first time in Europe in centuries the temptation to try it out must have been particularly like, quite strong. I certainly would have, if I just sort of had these, you know, these pagan spells translated in front of me at the, at the very beginning of this kind of transformation of the elite. The the temptation to not have a go at it is uh, it would be difficult yes, to it, resist. It, 
it's the keys of the kingdom, isn't it, essentially? Um, but there's one other reason why it would have been so authoritative at that time, and that was the visit of George Gemistos, better known as Platon, the age's greatest living authority on Plato, a member of the Byzantine ruling elite um, to Italy at this point you know, 1438, 1439, when he uh, was in Ferrara and in Florence. And I believe that the metaphysics of this deck derived directly from his teaching. So it, it wasn't just that the images occurred at that time. They had a very powerful presence uh, pushing them forward. A person who believed in a, a platonic ruling elite and wished to see um, that tradition, that uh, Hellenistic tradition, perpetuated as, as Constantinople collapsed, perpetuated in the up-and-coming states of the Italian Renaissance. So it, it was a deliberate attempt to introduce a pre-existing brotherhood into the Italian elite. And I don't, if, if people aren't aware, I don't think... Um... They may be they may be realized just how hard Platon was. Like he was, he was very he de-Christianized stuff that the Italians had Christianized in translation. Like he, uh, even if you tried to take the paganism out of his uh, Neoplatonism, he'd put it right back in. Uh, it's it was not a um, it wasn't a kind of nineteenth century affectation of going out into the woods and seeing Pan somewhere and and talking about folklore. He was he was into it. Like he it, it was. It was the real deal for him. Yes, it, the whole Hellenistic cultural tradition came through him. That that's the way he would have perceived it, and it was his personal responsibility to ensure its survival. Do you think? Does it sort of beg the question again? This is another um, evidence-free question. Um, does it beg the question that maybe there was even in um, Byzantium, following say the fall of Alexandria, a more or less uh, continuous tradition alongside uh, Christianity, like is, is, uh, does it imply the possibility at least that the streams were pure the whole way? I believe they were good um, because you can't suppress an idea, and there is nothing more liberating than the Gnostic worldview when you compare it with the um, outlook of the Christian Church under Constantine. And many of these Gnostic threads were held by early Christians, but uh, Const Constantine's conversion of that religion into a state uh, instrument, uh, an instrument of state policy, better to say, um, killed it, of course. But the spiritual side um, of humanity will always find its, its way through. And I believe that the essential ideas of what we what we call paganism is essentially a set of spiritual concepts based on in-depth experience. Yeah, and the Gnosticism, it strikes me, would be likely to survive among the highborn families in Byzantium more than anywhere else, because no one hates the boss more than the level just underneath. And so if you have the sort of ruling families, when you, you get a Constantine or, or a patriarch making all these decisions, saying, OK, all that stuff you believe is wrong, actually, this kind of grim reality is, is, is what we're selling, it will be the families just underneath him that go, this guy is bullshit. <laughs> I and would kind uh, of cleave to a, to a Gnosticism. Personally, I, I, I don't credit Constantine's Christianity one bit. He was one of the most brutal warlords, <laughs> of a very brutal warlords. He, he, he shone amongst them. Um, his use of Christianity was purely a policy instrument. It was. It may also have been a misinterpreted UFO, UFO sighting. You know, it could have been anything. Um <laughs> But uh, I mean, that's he saw something in the sky. <laughs> well, well, it was said of him that he did. Yes. It was said of him that he converted. But, you know, I, there's no sign in anything he ever did in his life that he would be a person uh, easily, you know, pliable by any priests. <laughs> no, that's true. Um, the the sort of largest, not largest, the most dominant, I guess, historical motif in the cards is Alexander the Great and 
various Alexandrian things. So what's he got to do with it then? Yeah, I th- this brings us back to the theme of bloodlines, doesn't it? Um, mm. The nine of the 12 named court cards um, represent figures uh, drawn from the Alexander Romance literature. And more specifically, they relate not to anything Alexander actually did in his life, but to his the, uh, his conception, which is a very strange focus to have on uh, Alexander the Great. And the story is that he was conceived by the god Ammon, um, and that, as most people know, his mother, Olympias, uh, was a serpent-worshipping or serpent goddess worshipping uh, figure. So the whole sub-theme uh, revolves around uh, Alexander's um, partly human, partly what? <laughs> Bloodline um, through the serpent deity Amon. And, and that's the only um, reason I can see uh, for the inclusion of that particular part of the Alex- Alexander Romance literature in the deck. It's, it's a strange um, corner of Alexander's story to make the dominant one, the dominant theme of the court cards. Well, see, it is strange. And this is kind of why I asked what you think they were used for, because it strikes me as a spell. Uh you have because one of the things that maybe people um, we, we want to tell people is that Amon hybridizes with Saturn, so you you kind of have that same you have an alignment with whoever's using the cards for whatever reason uh, between Alexander and and the kind of focus of the cards, which is Saturn. But you mm. also, if it's to do with his consumption, you are essentially using these as a spell to birth the greatest empire the world had ever known at the time. Uh, underneath these auspices, and that's a very Venetian thing to do. <laughs> that's a very Venetian attitude to the rest of the world, and I, that was kind of where I was getting at with the cards. Like, is this a spell? If they're focusing on Alexander's conception, and they feel they have that both the bloodline connection and also connection to the same sort of snake dragon mm. Saturn figure, are they trying mm. to? Um, is that what is that the spell? Is that one of the spells that's in this kind of card grimoire? Well, let me. Um, it's interesting that the Deste line also ruled the British Empire as it grew to its greatest extent. Well, yes, um, I would. Uh, this is this is in my lurid books, like the Financial Vipers of Venice. <laughs> <laughs> not not Venice. I'm torn of the, the um, Destin, Hanoverians. Yeah. No, absolutely. But George the first, second, third, so on. To to line that up, you have the. But it's the old competition, right? So, uh, for whatever reason, Henry the Eighth's divorce lawyer was a Venetian. Um, so mm. that's mm. weird. Uh, but there's Venice trying to get Henry, trying to get England, the, the country that has the best claim on the new world to break from Rome, which Venice doesn't like. So Mm. this is kind of what I mean by, I don't think people realize the long game that these North Italian families play. (laughs) (laughs) Either that or the entities behind them. Yes. Yes. We should um, (laughs) definitely, that's yes. On rune soup, that's more or less implied, but uh, (laughs) that, I mean, this is what I love about the cards for me. Um, Whoever whoever commissioned them, if they were commissioned, was crazy in a way that I think we'd all find... We probably wouldn't be a nice person to be around, but we'd all find quite impressive. Uh, there's um, this... Whoever used these cards or whatever intention they had for them, they were, they were very serious about it. Well, I remember um, Catherine Austin Fitt uh, did an interview once and somebody asked her what it was actually like to be around these individuals. She was working for the director of HUD, I think. And she said it was absolutely terrifying. Yeah. It was like some demonically possessed and you just didn't want to be near them. And the certainly uh, cold deus day under who this deck was uh, designed, I believe, Duke uh, Ercole de Este, his nickname was Northwind. Because that's, you know, that's how he came across. Yeah. <laughs> Diamond was another of his nicknames. 
Well, that's um, yes, hard, unbreakable, cold. Uh, you know, <laughs> these were not people to play with. <laughs> no, and they. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact. Someone, will, someone listening will get it. Um, but there was a saying in Venice, coming back to it: uh, Venetian first, Christian second. And, mm. uh, and and this is kind of this is what you're dealing with. These are the people that invented the modern banking system and and, and so on. So you're dealing with guys who are, yeah, pr- pretty into their pretty into their demiogeography. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I just think that we probably because of the way we're educated, we tend to put the church in such a central position. When we look at the cultural history, we we look at Byzantium and we think of the Orthodox Church. We look at Italy during the Renaissance and we think of the papacy. But these were just institutions on the chessboard for the individuals that we're discussing. They well, routinely, you, you, yeah, they routinely manipulated the cardinals, the bishops, the archbishops, most of whom were. Uh, members, members of their extended family. Exactly. Anyway. You just you just cycle the family. Oh, there's a there's a problem in this bishopric. It's like, well, send the third brother. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I think perhaps 18th and 19th century, the um, Christianity of Western Europe has distorted our historical view of events, and and, and the overlap of that is into Byzantium, where we assume that everything was under the influence of the Orthodox. Uh, church. It simply wasn't. The Orthodox Church felt threatened, was challenged by the humanist elite, and seriously worried about its own survival. So yes, these these people stood above um, political and religious ideology, and they were just counters on their board. Do you know it is how we're educated today? Because we have the the same attitude to any of our kind of ruling um, or governing or governance structures. We we have the same attitude where mm. we assume that that's actually the game, and it's just it's the height of naivete in the modern world to think that's the case, and it's just very poor history to to think it it wasn't. And th- and those two things join up because I I say this to my friends when we get into discussions that are very kind of rune soup related. I'm like, so you're telling me that after two million years of nothing but corruption, um a, a modern human enters the civil service in a in a developed Western country and is suddenly elevated beyond sin and can do no wrong. <laughs> mm. Is that is that what you think is going on? I, I think I think Gordon the, the difference is that for most people they have a core of morality that guides them through life, and they can't imagine people who exist outside of that. Yeah, and it might it might have actually it. been when you think about these people getting around um, Ferrara and Bologna and and, and Venice, uh, their big houses were on like the main canal and the main street, and you would rub shoulders with someone who may or may not either metaphorically or, or literally sacrificed a baby to Saturn. Um, the, the night before, who, who knows what went on, uh, you know, after the ball, and uh, you yeah. you don't get the same kind of uh, public display of tyranny and power. It's at a distance, so you, you you kind of don't have the context for how that works. Yeah, so certainly with Deste, they were um, they had a very antagonistic relationship with most of the population of their region. They were thrown out of Ferrara at one stage. They had major tax riots um, at another stage. And they built this massive fortress in the middle of the town with a moat and everything just to keep the population at bay. So, you know, these were not people who ruled through love and grace. No. No, it did come through. I mean, honestly, um, I. this is just the most fantastic analysis Um uh, reading through the book. Uh, when did you, I know you mentioned that you were doing some research on Mithraism and thinking about the cards. Do you remember the mm. first time you encountered the Solar Busca cards? Yeah, it was after the research on Mithraism. They they suddenly came into focus. Um, and, and that's a mysterious, don't, don't ask me why or how. All of a sudden, I found myself very focused on them. And, but as uh, in, like you were just browsing the internet one day, and they came up, or did you? Did, yeah. were you in Milan, or did you know? No, no, I was just browsing. Um, I'm not uh, 
there's different groups of tarotists, you know, there's the collectors, there's the gamers, there's the esotericists and the historians and, and so on. So I'm, I'm, I wouldn't consider myself a serious historian. You know, people like Dummett have committed themselves or did commit themselves to very uh, in-depth analysis of the tarot's history. Um, people like that tend to despise the esoteric side of things. So I'm far more on the esoteric side uh, of, of history. Um, so the solar busker is obscure. There's no doubt about it. You know, it's it, it's an insider's uh, topic in it, within the uh, historical tarot. Which is not exactly a large community to begin with. So yeah, it's like niche exactly. within a niche within a niche. And not just that, it's off-putting because it upturns all your expectations about the flow of imagery. You can't make sense of it. None of its narratives seem to make any sense. So it's easy to get frustrated with the deck and just, okay, you know, put it aside. But for some reason, it really gripped me. Um, and there was a huge energy involved in, in writing this book, I have to say. Well, I was going to start asking that. I mean, uh, this is... it's it's inspired essentially the analysis of it i feel like it's it's story wants to be told and it found you but to that end was the and i tend to ask this usually off the air of scarlet authors but uh w did anything was there anything unusual in the process of uh in your life in the process of going through the the writing the research and the writing of this book yeah there were about three times when i was um Possessed, had a huge energy. I mean, I'm, I'm a professional energy worker, Gordon. I, I, I do this for a living day to day. Um, but the energy that came through with this deck was of a fierceness and intensity I wouldn't wish on anyone. And uh, I caution anyone who thinks they can pick this deck up and start using it uh, for ritual purposes to take care. So it was the actual energy of the deck multiple times coming through during it. Because it seems like there would be, I almost want you to say, well, I had some very Johnny Depp in the Ninth Gate style experiences with things falling around me. And then all of a sudden I saw a baby, someone holding a baby upside down, not over a cauldron, but like it looked like it. And, you know, I, did, did, did you end up having reality kind of warp around the deck in some way? Or was it the energy is the most memorable thing that happened? It, it manifests itself in a, as a persistent pressure. And my partner, who was quite sensitive, kept picking up one word. She kept saying to me, Elohim, something to do with Elohim, again and again. And I was going mad with this. I know, There's nothing Judaistic in this deck, <laughs> thinking it, it was Elohim, you know. It wasn't that. It turned out, what, months into the research, I found a very obscure reference saying that an alternative name of Saturn is Elus, and the followers of Saturn are called the Elohim. Okay, so that that was directly channeled. I, I found it out good. later. Yeah. Um, the the other thing about the energy, its fierceness, is it, it locked up all my back muscles and thighs. I couldn't move for three or four days, almost like a paralysis. It was so intense. So I, I brought in an energy worker to help. They were standing about a meter or so away from me, you know, doing these, these like movements to like move the energy. And they almost fainted. They had to go out of the room. It was so intense. Well, it, uh, I, it sounds intense, but I'm very glad you went through it. <laughs> because... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Because again, this is this has been just yeah. It, it's it's astonishing. It's as simple as that. It is an astonishing book. Mm, thank you so much. All right, Peter. So obviously, uh, the the links to where people can, in fact, um, find it will be up in the show notes. But other than that, if people want to know more about your good self, uh, what should they do? Where should they go? Well, I, I have a, a website which I, I don't update very regularly. It's just my name, petermarkadams.com. And uh, I put essays up on my page in academia.edu for anyone who's interested. There's various cases of um, intercession of deceased persons in healing, um, possession, <laughs> 
various essays. Uh, also, a couple of the essays which uh, this book was built from are, are online over there. So they can always check that. Splendid. All right. Well, once again, congratulations. It's it's uh, excellent work, and it was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much, Gordon. I enjoyed it. So, Peter and I recorded this conversation two or three weeks ago, and as is my way, I left recording the outro to the very last moment. And so I've had a couple of weeks to think about why I like this book for reasons beyond its actual content, which is, of course, fascinating in its own right. And I think the answer to that is that the game of Saturn is an important piece in the contextualization of the Florentine magical renaissance. Now, not to diminish the achievements in any way of Dame Frances, but she sort of pulled out and elevated one specific thread of that process, which is the hermetically inspired, quote unquote, natural magic in the works of Ficino. But that incident happened within a wider process of Byzantine inheritance that included, you know, the Solomonic method and the general rediscovery of the late classical world. And it's clear from Peter's work that this inheritance was taken very seriously and explored intensely at the highest levels of North Italian society. So reading this book throws a new light on previously covered aspects of Western magical history and sort of rings the bell on the process of reconsideration and further recontextualization. So I commend it to you with both hands. And uh, and speaking of commending things to you, uh, I commend podcast subscription, either on YouTube or in your favorite podcast catcher. Uh, please do let me know your thoughts on the book at runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page. And find me on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.